Well, brothers and sisters, tonight I would like to share with you some of the things that I have learned about Jesus Christ which can help us to draw upon his grace and power in overcoming our personal Goliaths. I was always active in the church, but for most of my life I took the Savior for granted. I felt that I was inferior and unworthy of his love, and indeed, because of the kind of life I was living, I was unworthy. But what I didn't understand was how much he wanted to be part of my life and help me overcome that unworthiness. I mistakenly believed that I had to somehow make myself good enough for the Savior, good enough for God before they would accept me and be part of my life. And this tragic error cost me over 30 years of wasted heartache and defeat. Now the story of David and his Goliath changed my life when I learned how it can help us overcome our Goliaths. We have many problems in our life that often seem as overwhelming as a Goliath. You will recall that uh, there was a war between Israel and Philistine, and the two armies were camped on opposing mountainsides with a deep ravine in between. And across this narrow valley, the two armies could see each other and they could hear each other. And every day, the Philistines sent Goliath out to the top of the hill to challenge Israel to provide their champion. And the plan was for these two men to fight so that the, they could uh, determine the victor that way without the armies having to fight and have such a loss of life. But there was no one in the camp of Israel who dared to face this Goliath. Now David was too young to be in the army, but he had three brothers who were there. And so his father sent David to take supplies to them and see how they were. And shortly after David arrived in the camp, Goliath roared his daily challenge across the ravine. Am I not a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. And how surprised David must have been when he saw the reaction of Israel's soldiers. Even though they had already heard this same challenge 40 days in a row, they were still so frightened that they literally ran from the camp. Now perhaps they had good reason to fear. You know, Goliath was approximately 10 feet tall. Now I'm five feet eight, and this is ten feet. Goliath's legs, and arms, and uh, even his neck were protected by brass armor plates. He wore a brass helmet and enormous shield. In fact, his armor alone weighed over 150 pounds. The metal tip on his spear was so heavy it weighed over 18 pounds, just the tip. So no wonder they were afraid. After a teacher described Goliath to a young Sunday school class, one of the children remarked, Boy, I'm glad he doesn't live in our ward. <laughs> but you know, brothers and sisters, today we live in a world which is full of Goliaths. Goliaths of opposition and adversity and temptation which we cannot conquer without the help of God. Some of us, for example, have been overcome by the Goliaths of pornography and lust and sexual compulsions, while others have been overcome by the Goliaths of drugs and alcohol and overeating and other compulsions and enslaving habits. Some of us face the Goliaths of financial problems like unemployment or debt. Some of us find our Goliaths in our marriage relationships, while tens of thousands of singles are facing the Goliaths of loneliness and feelings of not being wanted. From time to time, almost all of us face the Goliaths of discouragement, depression, feelings of inferiority, guilt, anger, hatred. These are real-world Goliaths which threaten our spiritual survival. And Satan loves these Goliaths, and he tries to make us believe that they are too big and powerful for us to conquer. But, my brothers and sisters, the wonderful message of David and Goliath is that it is not necessary for us to live lives of defeat and misery and fear. The message of David and Goliath is that Jesus Christ came to give us victory over our own personal Goliaths, whatever they are. And it is a terrible tragedy when we settle for anything less than that because it is so unnecessary. And this is what I'd like to discuss with you tonight. I think what really got David's attention was the final insult which Goliath hurled across the valley. I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man that we may fight. And that insult was more than David could take. 
Looking at the quaking soldiers, he angrily demanded, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of Israel? The armies of the living God? Now let me ask you a question. How could it be that the trained, experienced, and armed soldiers of Israel quaked in fear while David, who was but a young lad and unexperienced in the ways of war, was not afraid to engage this giant in combat. I think the soldiers were afraid of this Goliath for the same reason that we fear ours. It was because they viewed his challenge in terms of their own limited strength and abilities. They did not understand the grace that makes it possible for God to give us strength and ability beyond our natural limitations. David knew something they did not know. He knew that when we are partners with the Lord, the power to overcome our problems is not restricted to the limitations of our own mortal abilities. Too bad David couldn't quote Alma 26 and 12 to them. I know that I am nothing. As to my strength, I am weak. Therefore, I will not boast of myself, but I will boast of my God For in his strength I can do all things. But those were the words of the Book of Mormon missionary Ammon. So listen now to the valiant words which David did say to Goliath. Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. That's 1 Samuel chapter 17. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. This is one of the most important statements I know of in all of Scripture. In the New LDS Bible, these inspiring words of David are cross-referenced to Doctrine and Covenants 105, verse 14, where the Lord Jesus Christ said, As I said in a former commandment, even so will I fulfill. I will fight your battles. What a surprise that is for those of us who thought we had to fight our battles all by ourselves. That is Satan's lie. The Lord has repeated this important doctrine many times. Consider, for example, Doctrine and Covenants 10482, where Jesus promised, Inasmuch as you are humble and faithful and call upon my name, behold, I will give you the victory. And in Moroni 733, the Savior said, If you will have faith in me, you shall have power. How much power? Power to do whatsoever thing is expedient in me. This is exciting. God doesn't expect us to do it all by ourselves. If we are willing to obey, God will actually strengthen us and give us the power to conquer our Goliaths and keep his commandments. Such was the knowledge and faith of young David who went boldly down the ravine, stopped at the brook to gather five smooth stones, put one of them into his sling and hurled that stone with deadly force and accuracy deep into Goliath's forehead. Then using Goliath's own sword, he cut off his head and created an eternal symbol for all who have a Goliath to destroy. I want to emphasize that this scripture is not just for historical knowledge, but it is there to guide us in the way we respond to our own Goliath. So, How are we going to feel the next time we find ourselves with our back to the wall facing a mental or emotional or spiritual giant that towers above our limited ability to resist? Are we going to quake and tremble and fear like the faithless Israelites who thought they had to battle Goliath with their own strength alone? Or are we going to meet our Goliath confidently and courageously like David who knew that we can trust in our Savior to be there to help us fight the battle and assure the victory. Now, brothers and sisters, I don't like to discuss my past from the pulpit, but tonight I feel impressed that telling you about my own battle with Goliath might help you in fighting your battles. I hope you will not be offended by my frankness. I am not suggesting that everyone 
should be as open and blunt as I will be. But I want to talk to you about the real world of sin and temptation and the awe-inspiring power of Jesus Christ to rescue us and lead us to victory over the problems which otherwise would defeat us. As a young boy, I fell captive to the Goliath of masturbation and later to pornography, and these two giant Goliath habits held me captive to my carnal nature for over 30 years. I mention this tonight because I have received letters from hundreds of men and women who have been addicted by these same Goliaths. It is an epidemic in our society. And like many others who are similarly addicted, my addiction to pornography was so strong. Every time I felt lonely or discouraged or if I just walked by a magazine display or saw someone at work looking at such magazines, I would be seized with overwhelming compulsions to indulge in that vile trash. And I tried not to give in to these temptations. I really tried hard. But often, when seized by such attacks, I lost control and went on pornographic binges, much like an alcoholic goes back to drink after a period of abstinence. Sometimes I spent hundreds of dollars a week on magazines and adult movies, but eventually I would become so saturated in the filth that I would just hate myself for what I was doing. And that self-disgust and guilt would give me the strength to throw it all away and begin the process of repentance again. You see, part of me was determined to conquer these Goliaths and live worthy of the celestial kingdom. But deep inside there was another part that was equally determined to continue in the sin. Have you ever been pulled apart like that? It's an awful way to live. Now sometimes by exercising supreme willpower I could withhold myself from the sin for several months at a time and it was wonderful. But even during those periods of abstinence the other part of me, the rotten part that loved the sin would be growing stronger and stronger and more insistent. The pressure to give in was like water building up behind a faulty dam. And Satan was always at my side, whispering that sooner or later that dam of restraint was going to break and wash me away in another cycle of sin. And he was right. Sooner or later my willpower crumbled and I became a living Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of person in my cycles of indulgence and repentance. And I felt desperate because of this up and down roller coaster ride. Perhaps you too have experienced such cycles. It's a horrible way to live. And it's so unnecessary if we will only accept the power of Christ into our lives and allow Him to change our carnal nature. But I didn't know that yet, so I struggled for over 30 years with this double life. I used every tool I could imagine to overcome it. I fasted and prayed. I attended my meetings, served in the church. I studied scripture several hours a day. I read dozens of psychology and self-help books. I set goals. I made promises to the Lord. I used positive affirmations. And still I continued to fall back into the filthiness over and over again. And through all those years of addiction, each fall destroyed part of my self-respect. Each fall made it harder to believe that I would ever conquer myself and be able to repent. I know what it is to be in a hole so deep that you can't see a way out. I know what it is to be held captive by a Goliath that only laughs at your puny efforts to resist with nothing but your limited willpower. I know what it is to hurt so much and to feel so worthless and hopeless and filthy, to hate yourself for the things you've done and can't stop doing that you just want to die. No, I take it back. It's not death you want, but total annihilation, to just cease to exist. I'm sure some of you have felt that same desperation. Now, intellectually, I knew that suicide was no answer. I knew that all suicide would do was transfer me into the spirit prison where I would be under Satan's control. But I was so full of hate for the creature I had become I could no longer live with my pain and I began planning my suicide anyhow. And before taking my life, I went for a walk along a river to offer one last prayer. It was not a prayer of faith, but a prayer born of frantic desperation and fear for what I was about to do. I told the Lord I just couldn't go on this way any longer. 
I told him that unless he reached out to save me, I would be lost forever because I just couldn't do it myself. After 32 years of defeat, I finally knew and admitted that I was never going to conquer this by myself. I knew and admitted to him that I was unworthy of his help. Yet I begged for mercy and, oh, those were bitter words. I hated myself for speaking those desperate words of surrender. I felt humiliated for admitting my helplessness to him. It seemed to me like the final overwhelming failure. I felt ashamed as if that was the lowest I had ever sunk. To beg God for help I didn't deserve and couldn't earn. And as I walked along that river praying for over an hour, I thought I had finally reached the end, when in reality I had finally reached the turning point. For it is only in discovering and admitting our need for God's help that our proud and stubborn heart is at last broken and we throw open the door to receive his healing influence. It is unlikely that we will ever really conquer our Goliath until we honestly admit to God that we are unable to solve our problems without the help of a higher power. How often Jesus emphasized this when he stressed that we must come to him not in the pride of our self-sufficiency and willpower, but as a little child who knows how much he needs the Savior's help. Brothers and sisters, once I acknowledged my need for Christ to save me, once I surrendered my life to him, once I learned how to get out of the way and allow him to take control of my life, once I asked for the Father's mercy to apply the blood of Christ to my sins, the Lord came into my life in a powerful way. And slowly, step by step, line upon line, weakness by weakness, over a period of um, oh, six months or so, he took away that horrible, enslaving love of carnal pleasure and lust. He freed me from my lustful compulsions and addictions. And in their place, oh, brothers and sisters, in their place, he blessed me with an overwhelming awareness of his love for me. He really loved me. In spite of all those years of filthiness, he loved me. And discovering and accepting his love allowed him to remove all those awful barriers of guilt and shame for my defeat and enabled me to know him and love him in return. People often ask me if I'm still tempted and the answer is, of course I am. As long as we live in this mortal world, we're going to be tempted. But now I'm free. Now I have a choice. Through Jesus Christ, my Goliath has been slain and I praise God and thank him for his mercy and kindness. Now I know that many of you have experienced defeat and despair and heartache similar to mine. But I testify that every one of you can also experience victory. I want you to know that God doesn't play favorites. What he did for me, he can do and he is willing to do for every sincere person. When we think of all that Jesus Christ did in his mortal ministry, we sometimes lose sight of the main reason that he came, was to rescue us from the evils we cannot conquer by ourselves. In Luke 19 and 10, the Savior said, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. It's a great encouragement to me to know that the Savior came to help those whom the world labels as the losers the failures, the sinners, the rejects, the outcasts. He came to help people who are hurting, people who are confused and discouraged, people who have made mistakes but want to get right with themselves and with God. His gospel was not given for perfect people, but for sinners, for people with weaknesses and flaws. Have you been lost from his approval? Then you are the one he is looking for. Oh, how he longs to just wrap us in the arms of his love. How great is his desire to convince each one of us that we are important and precious to him. Is my testimony 
that the more you learn about God's love for you, the more victorious you will be. And the less you know about his love, the more successful Satan will be in persuading you that you are alone, that you are on your own, that victory is impossible for you. So if we are to conquer our Goliath, there are some things we must learn, some things we must do, some attitudes we must change. You see, the Lord cannot save us and give us victory in spite of ourselves. If he is to lead us to victory, we must learn to cooperate with him. Otherwise, we block or prevent the very blessings he's trying to give us. I have a testimony that whatever Goliath you are fighting, he knows of your struggles and he already has your path to victory planned. So what I'd like to do now is share with you six keys that will help you to open the door and receive that victory. Brothers and sisters, no one is going to conquer their Goliath through the Lord until they learn how to apply his word to their particular problem. So the first key I would like to share with you is how to interpret the hopeful promises of deliverance and victory and how to make them yours. Please know that every principle or promise you find in the scripture applies to you just as much as if God had spoken it directly to you. Because in reality, he did. That's why he had the prophets record his promise so you could use them as his personal promise to you. It's vital, it is crucial that you learn to personalize the promises. Here's a scripture that validates this principle. In Doctrine and Covenants 82 and 5, he said, What I say unto one, I say unto all. Indeed, it is so important to our individual victory that we believe his promises apply equally to every child of God that he also said in DNC 61.18, And now I give unto you a commandment that what I say unto one, I say unto all. On September 2nd, 1989, the Church News taught us how to apply this principle of personalizing the scriptures. Speaking of the Doctrine and Covenants, it said, there are hundreds of promises from the Lord that are so casually stated that unless one is alerted to them, they almost go unnoticed. It is in these quiet promises that we can substitute our own name for those given in the Revelation. Put your name in front of it and the promise is yours. End of quote. Please remember this principle. Put your name in front of it and the promise is yours. What I say unto one, I say unto all. As an example of this principle, the article quoted one of my favorite scriptures, the NC 6 and 20, which says, Be faithful and diligent in keeping the commandments of God, and I will encircle thee in the arms of my love. I have a testimony that this promise is true, but I didn't experience it until I put my name on it and made it mine. Stephen be faithful and diligent in keeping my commandments. And Stephen, I will encircle you in the arms of my love. I experienced incredible joy and relief when I put my name on the victory scriptures and discovered that God didn't expect me to overcome my Goliath all by myself. We already quoted DNC 105 and 14, but let's do it again. Stephen, as I said in the former commandment, even so will I fulfill. And Stephen, I will fight your battles. See what a difference that makes? Remember Moroni 7, 33, John, Mary, whatever your name is, Christ has said to you, if you will have faith in me, you shall have power to do whatsoever is expedient in me. Brothers and sisters, there are hundreds and hundreds of these promises in the scripture and each one that you find and put your name on is like another stone to use in your battle against Goliath if you have difficulty believing a promise you find in the scriptures if the overwhelming circumstances of your present defeat make the promise seem impossible try putting your faith in the one who made the promise because Jesus Christ has placed his honor and integrity on the line when he promised, my words never fail. My words shall not return to me void. Who am I that hath promised and shall not do it? 
Now the second key to conquering your Goliaths is to stop being ashamed of your temptations. Many people go into a panic of self-condemnation when they are tempted to commit sin, not because they did anything wrong, but simply because for a split second or two they actually wavered and considered the possibility of giving in. I wish I could persuade you that it's not a sin to be tempted. It's just a normal part of mortality. The Apostle James said, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. That's James 1 and 12. Nowhere do the scriptures say or even hint, blessed is the person who never feels tempted. There is no such person. Even Jesus Christ was tempted in every point like as we are. And the scriptures are very careful to say that his temptations were so real and so intense that he actually suffered in overcoming them. Yet even though he was really tempted, he was still considered perfect and flawless because he never gave in. So it can't be a sin to be tempted. Don't let Satan destroy your feelings of self-worth for being human. Now there is an important difference between feeling godly sorrow and remorse for our mistakes and the twisted distortion of Satan that makes us feel ashamed to have a mortal weakness or imperfection. Of course we want to conquer our temptations. It's our sacred duty and stewardship. But inasmuch as God is allowing us time to grow, we must be humble enough to stop condemning ourselves and not allow our imperfections to form barriers between us and the Lord, or we will block the flow of His grace. I take great comfort from D&C 46 and 9, which gives us the assurance that the Gifts and blessings of the gospel are, quote, given for the benefit of those who love me and keep all my commandments. But there's a footnote. Those who love me and keep all my commandments and him that seeketh so to do. That includes all of us, doesn't it? So what is important to the Lord is not how perfect you are right now, but where your heart and commitment is. It's not how far you are along the path of perfection that counts most with Him, but the direction you are moving. Now let me share with you two ways to resist temptations. First, don't lie to yourself by pretending it wouldn't feel good or that you don't want to do it. You only confuse your brain and weaken your resolve. Instead, when temptations are pulling at you, tell the truth. Say to yourself, yes, that might feel good, or yes, that might be fun, but it is not worth it to me. This is very important to conquering your Goliath. You see, by saying it is not worth it to me, teaches your brain that you are giving up something you want for something you want more, for something that is more important. Saying it is not worth it to me when you are tempted will give your brain a true understanding of the situation and it will work with you and for you for your resistance instead of mistakenly believing that you want to give in. The second way to resist temptation is to focus your mind on the victory which Christ has promised instead of all the failures of the past. And one way to do this is by imagining Christ there at your side right during the temptation. Picture him lovingly placing his arm around your shoulder and offering you encouragement and strength. And if you would train yourself to do these two things, you will find it is almost impossible to give in to a temptation. It will make the difference between victory and defeat. Now, the third key to gaining victory is believing that you can change. Believing that you can totally change from what you are to what Heavenly Father wants you to be. Believing that with God, nothing is impossible. Satan will whisper, you can't change. It's no use trying. You'll always be this way. Who do you think you are? You can't ask God for help after what you've done. It's too late for you. You might as well give in and be your real self. You've all heard these lies echoing in your mind, haven't you? They come from your enemy. 
not from God. Now I'm not here to tell you that conquering a Goliath is quick or easy because it's not. But I am saying that with God's help every person can change. However, it is important to reach for the right kind of change. Some of you are involved in 12-step rehabilitation programs and I applaud you for that. I believe in the 12 steps because for one thing they teach us that no one can change. involved in 12-step rehabilitation programs and I applaud you for that. I believe in the 12 steps because for one thing they teach us that no one can change their carnal nature. No one can change their heart and disposition by iron job willpower alone. And I know this is true. We simply cannot solve spiritual problems with human solutions. That's why I failed for over 30 years. Now 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 5 counsels your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. Center your faith in Christ. Don't make the mistake I made of substituting willpower, behavioral modification techniques, modern self-improvement programs, psychology, therapy, all these things can be of much benefit in helping us control our undesirable behaviors. And this is good as far as it goes. But I testify that until we allow Jesus Christ to alter our hearts and desires, until we allow him to change our human nature, we will continue to suffer that struggle between the desires of our flesh and the will of our spirit. Now, when I was excommunicated, I thought, now I'm really on the edge of the cliff. Now I have to control my compulsions or I'll never get back into the church. I thought being excommunicated would force me to control the evil habits I hadn't been able to control for over 30 years. But brothers and sisters, going to the celestial kingdom is not based upon suppressing our evil desires with superhuman restraint and willpower. If that's all we do, the evil is only caged and locked inside of us like a ticking time bomb, just waiting for the right temptation to come along and light the fuse. I think many of you know what I'm talking about. Before I could win the victory over my Goliath, I had to learn the difference between merely controlling my habit and allowing Christ to change my heart and nature so that I no longer wanted the sinful habits. The testimony I once heard a former atheist give about his conversion to the gospel illustrates what I mean. After a lifetime of addiction, he could not give up his cigarettes. He wanted to quit, he tried desperately, but he just could not break their hold on him. Trying to figure out what the problem was, a friend asked, are you praying about it? Of course I'm praying. I'm doing everything I can. Well, then there's something wrong here. Tell me what you say in your prayers. I say, Heavenly Father, please stop me. Help smoking. What else would you say? Many of us make the same mistake this man made. We only pray about the symptoms of our problem instead of the cause. We pray, please help me stop lusting. Please help me stop eating too much. Help me stop yelling at the wife and kids. Help me stop drinking or smoking or taking drugs or whatever the problem is. These are only symptoms of our fallen carnal nature. And as long as we focus on the symptoms, we lose sight of the solution, the grace and atonement of Jesus Christ, which brings the mighty change of heart. This wise friend said, to the former atheist, all you're asking God to do is help you control an evil habit. No wonder you can't stop smoking. You should pray, Heavenly Father, I want to obey this commandment. I choose to obey this commandment. I am willing to obey this commandment. Please change my heart. Please remove this evil desire from me so that I can obey. What a powerful difference. It is the difference between victory and defeat. 
So we have talked about the inadequacy of willpower alone in overcoming our temptations. Alma 37.33 says, Teach them to withstand every temptation of the devil with their faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the fourth key is learning to make the Savior our partner by drawing upon his power in our battles. If we rely on our own power alone, we're going to fail over and over and over. But Jesus Christ never fails. So let's learn how to open our hearts to his power. After all, he is the Savior, and it is his job to save us. It is his mission to rescue us from the Goliaths we cannot overcome by ourselves. I wish I knew how to persuade you that God doesn't expect us to do it all by ourselves. In the 1983 October conference, President Benson said something of great importance to those of us who are fighting a Goliath. Only Jesus Christ is qualified to provide that hope, that confidence, and that strength to overcome the world and rise above our human failings. Well, I wish I'd understood that during my captivity. I thought I had to do it all by myself. I was touched by the experience of a new elder at the MTC who was failing in his language studies. He said to his instructor, I study constantly. I've tried the hardest I know, and I still can't learn it. It's just too hard for me, so I'm going home. The wise instructor replied, Elder, your trouble is you don't spend enough time on your knees. The elder repented of trying to accomplish this sacred assignment without the Lord's help. And once he allowed the Lord to become his partner in the task, he not only learned the language, he left the MTC at the top of his group. Now, after the Lord rescued me from my Goliath, I wondered for a long time, why? Why now? After all those years of fasting and praying, why didn't it work before? What I learned is that because of his respect for our sacred free agency, he will never force himself upon us. You see, even though I had been trying hard to overcome my faults, I had actually shut him out with my ignorance and prideful effort to do it all by myself. I would built my life on an entirely wrong foundation. So, my brothers and sisters, if you have been failing, if Satan has been dragging you down to the misery and shame of defeat, perhaps you too have structured your spiritual warfare on the wrong foundation. Perhaps you too need to change your focus to Jesus Christ and partnership with his power. In the 1972 Ensign, Elder Marion D. Hanks told of a father who assigned his son to remove a large rock from the yard. And the little boy tugged and pushed and lifted and struggled, but all to no avail. And then he enlisted the help of all his neighborhood buddies, but even together they couldn't even budge the boulder. Reluctantly, the little boy reported to his father that he could not move the rock. Have you done all you could? asked the father. Yes, said the boy. Are you sure you've tried everything? the father persisted. Yes, said the boy, I've tried everything. No, son, you haven't tried everything. You haven't asked me for help. And then Elder Hanks observed, some of us may be less happy than we could be because of our arrogance or pride. We think we are sufficient unto ourselves. We think we do not need God or his Christ. Why do so many of us fail to go to him? He is anxious to help, but he wants us to learn of our need for him. Allowing Christ to be our partner in the battle is the difference between victory and defeat. The fifth key tonight is keeping score, but not like you might think. Most people keep score of their failures. They can tell you exactly how many days or weeks or months it's been that they've been able to go without giving in and indulging their weakness. But there is a better way to keep score. How can you defeat a Goliath you can't identify? Now you can identify and measure the power of your Goliath by taking a 3 by 5 card and keeping score of two things. First, the number of temptations you face each day. 
I'm talking about the real confrontations with desire where that carnal, addicted part of you is screaming for you to give in. And the higher, more spiritual part of you is urging you to stand tall and resist. Every time you have to fight a battle like that and decide whether or not to give in, you take that 3 by 5 scorecard and put a slash mark on it. How many marks a day would that be for your habit? 5? 10? 50? The benefit of keeping score this way is discovering just how real and powerful your Goliath is. If you're going to conquer your Goliath, you must realize it is more than just a weakness or bad habit that you are struggling with. It is all out war with your enemy, Satan, who is determined to destroy you and you must learn. It is him you are fighting, not yourself. So the first thing you keep score of is the number of battles or temptations you face each day. The second thing to keep score of is the number of your victories. Not the number of days you resisted, but the number of temptations that you conquered. This is really important. If you have ten temptation battles a day with your Goliath, then in one week you have faced your Goliath seventy times, right? Follow the map. Suppose you give in on the last day. By only keeping score of the number of days between failures, you would only have six victories. But that's not giving you proper credit. By keeping score of the actual battles won, seven days times ten temptations a day equals seventy confrontations with your Goliath, and if you only lost one time, you still have sixty-nine victories. If you gave in twice during the week, you still have sixty-eight victories. You thought you were losing when you were actually winning. Try keeping this score this way. I promise it will immediately increase your hope and enthusiasm. It will give you more confidence and self-respect. It will give you more power to resist. And here's another reason for keeping score this way. If you come to that seventh day with nothing but a score of six days of abstinence, and the temptation's pressure would normally compel you to give in. It's not very hard to rationalize that you're only breaking a small score of six days. That's not much to give up before starting over. But if you have 69 victories on that scorecard, that is really something to hang on to. And you will find yourself resisting with more determination because it will not be so easy to give in and throw away 69 victories for one quick indulgence. And think of the power of your score after several weeks or months of, of keeping score this way. But there is more. The last part of keeping score is to report each day's total to your Heavenly Father before going to bed. As you kneel to pray, you look at your scorecard and you tell Him how many times that day you had to battle with your Goliath. Yes, you actually confide in Him the number of temptations that part of you wanted to give in to. And then you reassure him of your willingness to overcome those desires. And then you report to him the number of victories you achieved. You thank him for the strength to win those battles. You acknowledge that it came from him and you ask him, you plead with him to remove those evil desires from you so that he changes your heart and nature so that that carnal fallen part of you will no longer be attracted to those temptations and then over the days and weeks and months as you see your scorecards changing with fewer and fewer temptations that you wanted to give into you will know because you have measured it that the new birth is unfolding in your life you will fill your prayers with praise and thanksgiving for this miracle of divine grace that is transforming you into his image Keeping score can make the difference between victory and defeat. The last key I have to share with you is an affirmation of discipleship. The reason this key is important is because it will change the way you think about yourself and the way you think about Jesus Christ. Now I'd like you to take that 3 by 5 card and write or print 15 words on it. Let's all do this right now. Put the first six words on one line across the top. I am a disciple of Christ. 
if you will take this card with you everywhere you go and refer to it frequently through the day, then I can promise it will change your life. Now below the affirmation, I am a disciple of Christ, I'd like you to write seven more words. This is your personal commitment. The seven words are, I will do nothing to disappoint him. Carry this card with you in your purse or shirt pocket. Tape an extra one on the mirror, on your refrigerator, any place that you will see it frequently. These are two very powerful affirmations, and here's why. You cannot carry this card with you. You cannot read these commitments several times a day and then deliberately do things that a disciple would not do. And after you have used this card for a few days or weeks, you will find your thought process is changing. And when you are faced with temptations you might have wanted to give into in the past, your mind will say to you, wait a minute, a disciple of Christ wouldn't do that. After all he's given you, you wouldn't want to disappoint him. It's not worth it. Programming your mind with these two affirmations will help to break the negative habits the negative cycles of defeat. They will help you conquer any kind of Goliath you may be fighting. I know this is true. Now I can promise you that by using all six of these keys or principles which I have shared with you, you will develop a personal bond of fellowship with your Heavenly Father and Savior. You will find them walking with you closer than you ever dreamed would be possible. You will have new feelings of self-respect. You will be victorious over your Goliaths. And you will discover a peace and a joy you never dreamed possible. In closing, I want to tell you about two families who were spending a holiday in a houseboat on Lake Powell. It was a happy occasion until their 12-year-old daughter fell over the side and disappeared under the boat, which was under power. The father immediately dove in to rescue her. He couldn't find her. Then he discovered her at the rear of the boat, and it was a frightening situation. Her clothing was twisted in the propeller. She was hanging there helpless, trapped, unable to get free. The frantic father surfaced, quickly told him to bring knives, to cut her loose, and then began a series of dives, taking her air from his own lungs. He would put his mouth on her mouth and force his air into her lungs, and then struggle for breath himself as he fought his way to the surface, gulped more air, and returned again and again until the others could dive below the surface and cut her free. As I pondered this remarkable rescue, my mind has been drawn to consider the incredible situations you and I get ourselves entangled in as we fall from the straight and narrow path and plunge ourselves into the waters of sin and unworthy habits. Many of us are nearly strangled from the guilt and hopelessness we feel as we find ourselves entangled beyond our ability to break free. We suffocate from self-loathing and gasp for a breath of forgiveness and freedom. But I also stand in amazement and awe as our Lord and Savior always finds a way to reach us, to preserve us while he teaches us and works out the way of deliverance. Sometimes the changes come almost instantly, but usually, in accordance with his wisdom, it takes time, weeks, months, perhaps years, because it takes time for us to learn the principles that we need to understand the principles of victory that fill the scriptures. It takes time to receive the new birth and transformation of character made possible by his atonement. It takes time to replace bad habits with good ones and then make them a permanent part of the new nature which he's giving us. Don't let Satan discourage you if it doesn't happen as fast as you want it to. In Doctrine and Covenants 111, verse 11, the Savior promised, I will order all things for your good as fast as ye are able to receive them. So no matter how short or long the time required, as long as we are sincerely trying to the best of our limited ability, we have the promise of our great Shepherd and Savior that he will stay by our side and help us fight our battles until the victory is complete and we are fully his. 
let's do the best we can and then place our faith and trust in his timetable. Now to go back to that boat for a moment, can you imagine the anguish of that frantic mother and brothers and sisters and friends as they watched and waited anxiously to welcome their loved one back to safety? Can you imagine the happy shouting and joyful hugging on that boat when they finally brought this girl up from the waters of death? Of course you can. But what I want you to picture, what I want you to think about, is the rejoicing in heaven when we are cut free from our entanglements in Goliath. I want you to project yourself forward in time and space to that glorious reunion that will someday take place on the other side of the veil. I want you to envision the future joy and rejoicing that you will experience as your heavenly father and mother receive you, welcome you, embrace you, and the Savior who made it all possible. Brothers and sisters, if you would conquer your Goliath, cling to that vision, dream of it, long for it, keep it alive in your mind and heart, someday it will be yours. In the name of Jesus Christ.